Oh, hello everybody. Very excited to be here today. My name is Martin. Um, as mentioned, I'm from Vacuum Labs. We are a company based in Slovak and Czech, and Czech Republic. We do fintech, we do crypto, and we were actually behind the inception of this very conference some three years ago. So today's talk will be about data fetching, and I'm super glad that all of you folks are actually here now because really the original title, Convenient Data Fetching in Iraq Using Higher Order Components, that's not the best title in this day and age. First off, fetching, that is like so three years ago, who would do fetching on their own? In, and remember, three years, that's a lot of time when talking about Java, JavaScript world. So who would be fetch, doing fetching in 2018 when we have all of these wonderful frameworks that do this for us? Furthermore, higher order components, nobody's ever using them again because we all have hooks now and hooks are awesome. Yeah, so um, you've probably seen the questions from yesterday. You've all heard at least something about hooks. And uh, the main idea is that it does not really matter what kind of abstraction you will use. Um, the core of this talk isn't affected by using higher order components or hooks or even render props. And the core of this talk will be about handling asynchronous data in React and about creating a good abstraction for handling them. So, and there already are some pretty good abstraction out there. We've mentioned Apollo. And Apollo does some really nice stuff. You will first define the query component. You will define your resource that you need for your presentation layer to re render. And then in your child components, you will receive whether the resource is still loading, whether there was an error, and finally, the data that you need to present. And this has some really, really tasty features behind it. And I'm not necessarily talking about the GraphQL model. What I like much more is, first off, that your presentational components now live in a magical fairyland where all of their, their data is always available. Then you don't have to worry about fetching it. They don't have to worry about the data not being there. Once they are rendered, they know they have the data available. Second off, we were defining the resource that we need in the query component, but we are only defining that resource. We are not defining an imperative model where we fetch it directly. And this is also something we really want from, uh, from our presentation component, that they don't really care on what lifecycle hook or when that resource is fetched. They only care about it being there at the moment that they need to render it. So, this stuff exists, and it exists mostly on top of uh, other query languages. Relay and Apollo use GraphQL and have rather similar approach. Falcor also provides this, and he has his own query language. But really, these query languages provide you with a lot of nice stuff. But uh, what we have just defined isn't dependent in any way on those. So. What we would like is having something like this over a REST API. And quick call into the audience who, is, who has been using REST API over the last year on their project. Yeah, a lot of And my assumption was that pretty much everyone, if you've been using only GraphQL or something like that, that's awesome for you. But REST is still here, and there's nothing wrong about that. That might be everything that we actually need now. And that does not mean we have to look up to the cool kids using GraphQL uh, and just handling this in weird ways ourselves and looking like, wow, like we would like a framework like this. So what we will be talking about is bringing the same level of convenience as we have shown with Apollo to something built just on top of React. Uh, we will even let you bring whatever state management that you like. And we will all do all of this strictly on client. No need to do anything on the server. We'll do it on client, and we will do it all with native fetch. Indeed, let us make using fetch great again. So, and 
since this talk exists and since this framework exists, that means that the naive approach probably had some problems. So let us first define those problems, otherwise there would be no need for making it great. So what is the naive approach? Um, you have your component, you need it to display some remote data. So the most straightforward thing to do, something that all of us using React have probably done, is we fetch the data directly in the presentational component. So we will add some state, we will add um, some lifecycle methods, we will check whether we are still fetching or whether there has been an error, and finally we display the remote data. And this is fine, it does the job. It certainly does the job for small application, but as your code starts to grow, there are a couple of buts, actually. So what if you have multiple components requesting the very same resource? And it does not really matter if it's the same component, just different instances, or if these are completely different components. If you use this naive approach, you will need to fetch the same resource two times. So this means that you have a redundant request. And also, if you are not synchronizing already over some state management, uh, this can lead with your, to your page getting out of sync, because the second component will probably fetch a bit later. The data might have changed. He might have received different data. And yeah, that's because they don't share the data between them, so that's a pity. We can solve that, of course. And again, the naive way to solve this is just to abstract this using component hierarchy. We will create a data fetcher component um, whose, child, uh, whose children will be uh, the, component that, the components that actually need their resource, and this will solve the duplicity. We will only fetch once. But while it solves the duplicity, it will make a bunch of other problems pop up that we also now have to work. First off, it might be really hard to do this correctly. It might be hard to find the place where we can put this component so that all the components that require the data are underneath it in a hierarchy. If the components are really far apart on your web app, this might be all the way to the root of your application. And once we have them in the root of our application, that means that we still have to handle the loading and error states directly in the presentational components. And as we've mentioned, we don't want to do that. They don't care about the uh, resource not being there. We just want them to display their resources. Furthermore, inevitably, there will come a time where you will change your app around. This might not even be you. It may be someone maintaining the app one year down. And he will need to take one of the components and move it something, somewhere completely else in the hierarchy. And he might not know about the data fetcher. He might just do this, and suddenly he will move one thing, the whole app will break, and he will just roll his eyes that why, why does this even happen? So the problem is that using the component hierarchy maybe isn't the best abstraction that we can provide for this data fetching. Indeed, we would want the same thing as we had with Apollo. We want to define the resources directly on the components which consume them. But we want them to be fetched somewhere else, somewhere in the background. We also want this fetching to happen for the first time when the first component requiring it renders. And then if any subsequent components require the same, same resource, unless we tell them something else, we want them to render the same resource we have fetched initially. So naturally what I'm talking about is some form of caching. But again, this might not be that straightforward. We might need um, some smart stuff from it. So what would we need? First off, uh, it's not enough to know about the resources we have already received. We also know about the requests that are still in progress. Otherwise, we will just run into the same issues we had before with duplicity, only on a smaller scale. Second off, uh, if someone updates the data after some time that they are already rendered, rendered, we need some mechanism to update all of the components which listen to them. And 
This is something that state managers already handle pretty well, so we can probably reuse them. And third off, we might ultimately need more control over the cache invalidation. We might need to tell our app to invalidate the cache at a certain moment. We might tell it to invalidate it after some time. Indeed, we might need not only to invalidate, but to refresh the resource regularly, so to do some kind of simple polling. And while we are doing all of this, we need to be handling the loading and the error states correctly. Indeed, this is starting to look like a lot of work and a lot of code to just do some simple fetching. And we haven't been talking about error handling at all so far. So you have to handle the errors that you receive from the server. You have to er handle your 400s, your 500s. You have to handle those weird errors where the server returns 200 OK and has the error inside the body. You even should be handling when the fetch itself fails. Because, of course, we never just write the cache with the console log so that the linter does not complain. And this is something you will be faced with on every web application you will be developing, essentially. At least every that will be connecting to some form of a REST API. And it was the same for us, for our company, basically on every new project. So what we've done instead of rewriting all of this logic, this bunch of logic all over again, we've done what good lazy programmers should do, and we have abstracted away. I'm very glad that this meme leaves. It was also on the previous presentation. OK, and this is not a groundbreaking thought. Uh, for example, yesterday on main stage, you could have heard the same about uh, the headless components, and really shout outs to that presentation as well. That was great. Uh, and also, it's something that we as a React community have done before with the state management. Long time ago, before the flux wars had ha happened, uh, we have managed the state just in different React components. We have saw that this is a tangled mess. And the way that we've abstracted it is that we've moved this out of our presentational components. And moreover, we did it in such a way that the components don't know nothing about the state management happening about them. They only receive props as they need them, and they don't care how those props came to be. And this is the same thing we want to do with uh, the asynchronous data. We don't need and indeed don't want our React and our state management layer to know anything about the big bad internet there that will take time to fetch your data that may er er error out and ultimately not render. We want them to live in a magical fairyland where all of their data are available just at that moment that they need them. All right, so the way we've abstracted it is that we took away all of the fetching business and put it into a single library. And uh, it handles all of the hard stuff that we were talking out of the box and much more conveniently. And moreover, um, just like uh, the state layer and the React layer shouldn't care about the data provider layer, shouldn't know nothing about it being there, uh, so do our library. So does our library not care about the layers underneath it? It only needs React to work, and uh, it lets you bring whatever state management, whatever other tooling that you might use that you might like. And the key is that the the only thing that this library should do is handle and synchronize the data fetching. So how does it look? We define those two abstraction points in the beginning, and we will be getting back to them. We want to define the remote resources. So we'll do that. We'll create, create a resource. We'll give it a unique name. We'll tell it what it should do once it receives data. That is probably store it somewhere in your state. And finally, we tell it how the data is acquired 
but this acquisition will not be done on the presentation component itself. The, pro the components will require the resource, but this, recife, this recife, recipe to acquire the resources will be happening somewhere behind the scenes. And second off, we want to wrap them around our components in such a way that they know they are completely oblivious to the data provider layer. So the way that we do that is we define a higher order component where in an array we provide them with all of the resources. And um, I can already hear everyone that, yeah, they uh, higher order components. We are not using that. We are using hooks. It does not really matter. Higher order components are available to us now. Once hooks are available, we can do the same thing with hooks. Uh, but the key is the abstraction, those two points of abstraction, the obliviousness of our wrapped components, and also the fact that we define only what data is needed, not the other imperative way. So we've written these, I don't know, 10 lines. There is some useless stuff in the second example. And we have our fetching. We have essentially what is a simple Apollo client built on top of REST. And yeah, that's pretty great. It's pretty convenient to use, actually. And there is still more. We've glanced about, uh, we glanced off, we just hand waved uh, a lot of stuff, a lot of problems we were talking about before, but they are usually solved by a single line of configuration. So you probably want to uh, configure your placeholder components. You want to configure your loading, your error components. You just put it in the resource, or you can configure it globally. You want to configure uh, your uh, your resource to be cached, you just tell it to cache for some time. You can tell it to poll regularly. You can even define initial data which helps you with server-side rendering, where the fetches themselves don't happen. Remember that cache that none of us, if we are horrible programmers, are not handling. By default, we will interpret this as a failing network, and what we do, we will simply try to refetch a couple times. You can configure this, you can uh, opt out of this. Uh, this is a great convenience out of the box if you are working with an app for mobile users, because mobile networks tend to fail, and sometimes it's all you need. All you need is to just refetch a couple of times and the resource will arrive. Furthermore, you might need to eagerly preload some of the data. You have your article, you have your comment section. Uh, you don't need to display the comment section right away, but you want it to be ready. And you can easily define data that should be preloaded this way. And moreover, this data will not block your loads of the resources that are necessary for your app to display. This will happen first, and once those are ready, you will get your eager preload. All right, and we were talking about a lot of data fetching and REST API, but this abstraction does not care. It works perfectly well with any kind of asynchronous data. So if you are working on React Native, for example, handling a lot of the mobile APIs, which tends to be asynchronous, you can use this just as well to get the data into your component. All right, and finally, um, we've talked about this being uh, completely oblivious or not caring about the state management that you use. That is true, you can plug in whatever state that you like, but we are using Redux a lot, so it comes with a bunch of conveniences while you are using Redux. For example, in your own data, you will usually want to put the data you have received into the store, so we provide you with a dispatch out of context. So, well, we take it out of the con React context so that you can use it. And this works really well with uh, Redux's model of containers. If you are writing Redux, you've probably heard about this model where you put your presentation components into one file and your container files into the other file. The container, uh, the container component. The container component takes care of connecting your components to the state. And this all works well unless you are connecting to some parts of state that first needs to be fetched from the internet. But it is a problem no more because 
redundancy is not a problem in this model, so we can just wrap every connect we have in the application, every connect that is connecting to parts that first need to be received from the internet, we wrap it with, with data providers, and we can be sure that at the time that this connect happens, you might have some complex selectors in there that may fail in various ways, that all the data that you actually need for the selectors to happen and to work um, will, will be there, will be available. Moreover, we have now abstracted a bunch of logic away from the presentational component, and we can reuse it across wide scale of other components. And it does not really matter if they are on the same platform. We can easily reuse them between React and React Native. And this is, again, something super strong that we are already using and that we are super happy about. It lets us skip a lot of writing when we can do this. All right, uh, we're approaching the end. So first off, this is not something, of course, we have written it to solve the problems we were solving in the company, but it's also not something we wanted to keep in the back office. In fact, it is being used in production already today, and again, the, that is a bit unfortunate, but there is a page called Verenia Digital, uh, it's a Slovak page, and it's something I want to plug because it's a really cool open source project we were honored to participate on. It is a project that lets you easily search and browse public data about government officials, politicians, and companies in Slovakia. And it is really great that a tool like this exists, and if you are interested in that kind of field, certainly check it out. So. We were glad to cooperate on it, and if you visit the page, every piece of data fetching in there, every piece of asynchronous data handling in there is written using data providers. And it works pretty well, and it was really fun writing the app. It unburdened us a lot to do this. So, of course, the library is ready. It's open sourced on GitHub. We will be happy for any comments and pull requests. And really, we will be happy if you provide us with any kind of feedback, because this asynchronous data thing is a hard problem indeed. And even if the feedback is that this kind of abstraction does not work for you at all, we would love to hear it, because this is something we could improve on as a React community. And we can only do this together. We can only do this by sharing ideas. So. Even if it turns out that this is not the way to go, we would love to build on each other's ideas towards something that would be easy to use and convenient for all of us. So to wrap this up, the main, point, main points. First off, it's not GraphQL or DAI. You can write nice APIs, nice abstractions today with the REST architecture just fine. GraphQL provides you with a lot of nice stuff, uh, but you don't need to switch technologies only to arrive at a clear code. Second off, the key points, uh, at least in my opinion, in abstracting the asynchronous data fetching are first off to keep the presentational components and state management completely oblivious to the fact that this is happening, and second off, to be able to define the data that is needed directly on the presentational components but to handle the acquisition somewhere else, somewhere in the background. And finally, on top of these abstractions, we have built a library. Uh, we would be super excited if you check it out. With that, thank you for your attention. The link to GitHub is there. Uh, the slides are on convenient-data-fetching.now.sh. And if you are interested about how it is used, where it is used, you can check out verenia.digital. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. You did a, a great point um, at the end of the talk. Uh, sometimes we go uh, crazy. We, uh, I mean, I'm a big fan of GraphQL myself, mm -hmm. but some people just take it without any uh, reasoning behind, and it's a little bit dangerous sometimes. And it's good to see some examples of applying some of the same techniques, but without bringing the whole stack.
So that, that was awesome. In Thank fact, you. I'm also a big fan of GraphQL. It's just that it might not always be option, might not always be the right option. So it's great to have options also there. Cool. So let's take, uh, let's take one question. Right. Let's see um, what we have. So we have this, why would you choose high order components over query components? OK, so this was because, as mentioned, this started off by solving problems we were using, we were, we've had in the company. And uh, we were using a lot of state management. And it might be really hard to synchronize the remote data with your state manager if you are doing it as a, I assume that something like query component, something like Apollo, the render props. And also, since we were already using React, a lot of how it's done is modeled after how React, uh, React I'm sorry, Redux. Yeah, a lot of it is modeled after how Redux is doing it. So just like you have the connect, what is with data providers is essentially a remote connect, a connect to remote resources, if you would say. And that's, the, that's the reasoning behind this kind of abstraction. But yeah, of course, hooks, hooks are great. Hooks will be great. <laughs> Cool. We, we have time for a couple more questions. So what about using uh, connecting Redux Saga? So we are using Redux. Redux Saga. Uh, I'm afraid I'm not really qualified to answer this because I haven't ever used Redux Saga. But overall, uh, we have many times we have abstracted this logic into something Redux-based. And what I feel is that just like beforehand, we were entangling the fetching logic with the presentation component logic. This is just putting together the state handling logic with the data fetching logic. And I feel those are still different domains, and they should be kept apart and only communicate between each other. So, that's, but I've never used Redux Saga. Uh, that's that's the disclaimer there. Oh, that looks, that looks cool. Well, thanks for your answer. Here, let's take the last question. So would you say the upcoming suspense and React cache features make some of these uh, strategies necessary, or they will still yeah. be uh, useful? Yeah, so we were thinking about this a lot, actually. And we feel that, yeah, React suspense and React cache make a lot of the straightforward like the, the very basic pattern is now made much easier. It's much easier than the original fetching pattern. Uh, but still, um, this is, I feel that library like this or abstraction like this is built like one level higher. So something like React cache and suspense would, for example, allow us to write what is done in this library in much more straightforward way, but the features that this brings, the abstraction that this brings, and also the conveniences with uh, caching and polling and the management of this uh, is still something a bit stronger than what Suspense and React Cache brings you out of the box. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Martin. Um, of thank course, you. if you have more questions and you want to reach to Martin, uh, he will be happy to, uh, to answer your questions. Yeah, also, um, I'll be hanging around the vacuum labs stand throughout the most of the day, so you can catch me now or catch me later there. Okay, thank, thank, you. thank you again.